Hello, I'm Dr Judith Hudson uh, and I'm one of the very few presenters today who does not actually have dyslexia. Um, however, um, I have a strong interest in it. I'm married to a lovely person who is dyslexic uh, and I have a lovely grandson who is also dyslexic and dyspraxic. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the value of peer support. The issues of uh, disclosure, uh, whether or not to disclose that you have dyslexia um, to the significant others in your life, uh, and developing self advocacy skills, um, one of the best tools that a dyslexic can possibly uh, have in their survival kit, um, self advocacy. Okay, um, I'm going to look first or, or just go quickly go through the, the difficulties that um, weaknesses and strengths that are inherent in a, a diagnosis of dyslexia. A lot of you that are watching will have a, um, a diagnosis of dyslexia but for all of those that have there will be probably five ten others that haven't but think they might be dyslexic or have somebody with dyslexia in the family or somebody that they work with. So just sort of going over, it, it's for everybody's sake, so we all know what we're talking about. Uh, then look at the, the difficulties of comorbidity. Comorbid means coexisting, uh, so it's more than one condition, dyslexia and dyspraxia, dyslexia and ADHD. Uh, looking then at peer support, what it is and how you can use it. Uh, can it help? Is it a hindrance? Um, and looking at some of the issues there. Then the very thorny issue of dealing with disclosure, uh, a time of anxiety for a lot of people. Um, for others, it's a time of relief that they've been able to share it with other people. But looking at some of the issues that surround disclosure, then looking at the emotional consequences, um, positive and negative. And finally, look at developing self-advocate skills, educating yourself as well as you can about dyslexia and then educating others. Uh, and self-advocacy is probably the best tool that any dyslexic can have in their survival toolkit. What do we know then about dyslexia? Well, uh, Professor Rod Nicholson uh, has given a good description here. It's estimated at least one in 10 people um, dyslexia affects people the way they learn, which is different to everyone else that's not dyslexic. Uh, and it's not just about reading and spelling, and it's not an indication of low intelligence. Unidentified though, dyslexia can result in low self-esteem, high stress, behaviour problems and low achievement. But with the right support, children and adults with dyslexia can achieve as much as anyone else. And he wrote a very good book that was published in 2015 uh, called Positive Dyslexia. And it really is a, an encouraging and enlightening um, book to look at. So what are the dyslexic strengths? Well, they can include the ability to think up new ideas, good problem solvers, uh, effective communicators, Good intrapersonal skills, people skills, um, empathy, kindness, helpfulness. Uh, interpersonal skills are all about self-awareness and controlling your own internal attitudes and your inner processes. Your skills from within, if you like, uh, and empathy seems to be one of the traits that many, many dyslexics carry. And my grandson certainly had on his reports all the way through primary school that Sam is a very kind little boy uh, and he's gone on to be a very kind adult as well. Um, so good at looking at, at the unseen and, and sort of seeing what you can do in terms of creative ideas that sometimes other people just miss completely. And having light bulb moments, light bulb moments that you actually have a fantastic idea and quick as you thought of it, it it's disappeared again, but light bulb moments can be very useful as well. Okay, weaknesses then. These are more often promoted than the, the strengths. Uh, reading, writing and spelling. Those are the three things that people think about dyslexia, then that's what it's all about. It's reading and writing problems. It's more than that. Uh, you could have numeracy problems, mathematic problems, um, motor difficulties, uh, not very dexterous, so unable to use scissors and, and things competently, um, clumsy, 
uh, memory difficulties, uh, difficulties recalling information, spelling of words and finding words, people's names, uh, just at the wrong moment when you're required to produce that information and you have a brain freeze and you cannot find that word you're looking for. Organisation skills, that's just with personal organisation and within where you're working, living or whatever. They can be very disorganised and very untidy or go the opposite way and be OCD, very, very tidy um, because they need that structure and organisation within their lives. And time management's a problem for many <clears throat> and keeping track of ideas is also a problem. So comorbidity then, <clears throat> it's coexisting conditions, that's all it means, it's, it's dyslexia and something. And these were the most common ones. Dysgraphia, writing difficulties. Yes, it is writing difficulties, but it's more than just <clears throat> a handwriting problem. Um, there was a time that when dyslexia was diagnosed, it included dysgraphia, ADHD, um, it, it, not ADHD, but attention, certainly. Uh, an inherent uh, within the, the diagnosis of dyslexia was it would be a problem with handwriting, a problem with maths and numbers, um, problems with um, more uh, coordination. But they've, they've become separated in um, over the years, as we found out more and research has been done. Uh, and these are now sort of disorders on the, in their own right, if you like. But they're also still part of a dyslexic diagnosis or can be. Dyscalculia then, problems with numbers, not just problems remembering how your times tables goes, that's the, the one that's quoted at you every time, well, why you couldn't learn my times table. Um, it's, it's beyond that, it's seeing the relationship between numbers, uh, seeing greater than, lesser than, understanding what more than and less than, actually understanding concepts of numbers, the tenness of ten, the twentiness of twenty, knowing what twenty things looks like. Look at me linking the abstract with the with the the concrete if you like. Uh, and children with dyscalculia and adults with dyscalculia depend on support longer term than anybody who's not dyslexic. So most phones nowadays have got calculators on um, and using a calculator isn't a problem, but actually processing it in mental arithmetic would be a problem. As many as 30% have an attention problem uh, and the Institute of Dyslexia uh, actually have come up with the International Dyslexia Association, sorry, have come up with as many as 30% may also have ADHD. Um, that's full-blown ADHD and not just a problem with attention. Dyspraxia, again, is another one. Coordination. Um, you'd get with that one poor handwriting, which you'd also get with uh, dysgraphia. Uh, and then body posture, space, understanding where they are in terms of space, clumsy people, um, always sort of invading other people's space, always spatially unaware that they might be causing discomfort to other people. Um, but not deliberate, none of it's deliberate. It's, it's just that they're not understanding the you know, concept of space um, in the same way as somebody who's not dyslexic or dyspraxic. And some autism spectrum conditions as well, uh, you'll find dyslexia present in those or the other way around. Aspects of difficulties then, poor short-term memory, visual memory and auditory memory. Um, those modalities are where weaknesses occur. So the memory of what you see, if you think of spelling a word, if you've actually seen the word for a couple of minutes and then try to write that word down, it's recalling according the pattern, visual pattern of what that word looked like. Uh, if you're writing down information, it's actually visually holding that memory long enough to actually do something with it. Uh, and the same with hearing, um, the perception of, of the auditory sort of sounds and sensations, they fade far more quickly than in non-dyslexics. So, for example, if you're repeating information, if somebody's given you 
a five digit code to remember and you start sort of saying it to yourself, you know, nine five eight, no, nine five eight, five, nine five eight and sort of moving away and went to write it down, transposing numbers within that sort of structure of digits. That's where you, where you be, uh, auditory memory fade kicks in and you've lost half the information, usually the crucial part of information. Um, difficulties associated with perception and motor difficulties. <coughs> Excuse me. So movement, um, clumsiness, trips easily, lack of dexterity, lack of spatial awareness, in, especially in the workplace. Anxieties, fear and panic. Adult dyslexic can become locked into a spiral of these physical symptoms where panic attacks and migraine um, and reduced immunity and susceptibility to infection. Despondency, depression and despair, and this is meaning you form a, a seriously falling into clinical depression. Um, where dyslexic adults, dyslexic adults are reported to be more at risk of negative thoughts and emotions. And frustration and anger, feeling grounded negatively in the workplace, trapped or imprisoned, but, but not wanting to go for promotion or go for another job because of your insecurity about them finding out that you are dyslexic or otherwise. Excuse me. So to recap on general difficulties, where dyslexia can impact on young people and adults, <clears throat> short-term memory, poor working memory. Uh, I'll give here an example. If I asked you to add six and three in your head, and this is a very simple example, but add six to three, then add nine, then take away four, then divide by two. And you can see the processes that are involved with each of that. First of all, you've got to remember you're adding, right? Six add to three. You've got that two cool, nine. Then add nine, so you've got 18. Take away. Now, take away what? Take away four from what? The 18's gone, so you go back to nine and keep repeating the stages until you find a response or an answer <coughs> that you think is the right one. Sequencing and structuring of information, uh, going back to dysgraphia, uh, if you actually um, have a problem with coordinating information into written information, uh, getting the sequence of a story, a beginning, a middle and end, getting the sequence of a report, uh, an introduction and a middle and a conclusion, um, structuring of, of any form of information requires a sort of a pattern um, and this is something, the difficulty that dyslexics, many dyslexics have, actually getting the sequence of events into the right pattern. Remembering messages and following instructions. So being given a message um, with two or three instructions in, by the time you've delivered the message that you've forgotten which is the middle one or you've forgotten which is the first one. Uh, and following instructions, if somebody gives you four or five instructions and you go away to do the five instructions and you can remember possibly the first one and you could remember the last one, but the few in the middle, you can't remember. So remembering people's names, uh, always important in the workplace, certainly, um, but it's not easy if you, if, if you can put a face to the person you're talking to fine but if you know, people do like you to remember their names as well so it's remembering what their names are and working out a, a system that would have worked for you for actually recalling that a person's name that is important misreading information so when you're checking for typos in written work uh, you can't see the errors because you can see the words that are missing as you're reading it through. You can't see anything wrong with that. But you're actually reading it how you're thinking it, not reading it by what is there. Um, text to speech and speech to text softwares have helped tremendously. Uh, and it's always good to get the, the text to speech to read anything that's written that's important and, and is going to another audience to see if you can hear the words that are missing. Perception of movement, the difficulties there, the way you move around, whether you, you sort of you clumsy, whether you're always touching things or, or having to hold on to things or whatever. Um, 
writing difficulties, structuring your writing, as I said, following instructions and looking for your typos. All of these are inter interrelated, but they're skills that will possibly be uh, presenting a problem in the workplace or if you're a student. And poor timekeeping and missing appointments. A lot of dyslexics are actually very good timekeepers, but also the, if they stick to a, a, a religious sort of routine of a time, that's fine. It's the, the unexpected that they miss. Um, and missing appointments sometimes is complete accidental and they have no idea that they've done it. Uh, but it can be very, very important to be in a place at a certain time after having made that appointment. Uh, so that is viewed as poor timekeeping keeping when it is really a genuine error. So having to develop really um, a strategy to manage your time and to, to record that time management so that you've got reminders put in place to keep you actually on time or to keep you uh, attending an appointment that you should be attending. So what do uh, what does dyslexia mean to you? Well, Price and Gerber they did a piece of research a few years ago, and these are some of the things that they found that dyslexics were saying when when what does dyslexia mean to you? And these were some of the responses. It's frustrating not to be able to complete tasks on time, being different to everyone else, wanting to read books but not getting past the first few um, pages, feeling different from everyone else inconsistency in my work. Some days it goes right, another day I can get the same work wrong. And that's a, a difficult one in the workplace as well. As if you've shown you can do it one day and not the next, um, people wonder what on earth is going on. And difficulty listening to, to others um, for more than a few moments, listening con uh, losing concentration. So if you're sitting in a meeting, the first few minutes of the meeting are crucial that you understand what you're there for and what the focus of that meeting is, um, but once people start talking, the child concentration goes. Uh, you've probably switched off listening to me, <laughs> me now, but I do hope not. But uh, um, if you have lost concentration, I do apologise. Um, <clears throat> so dyslexia can, what, why peer support? Because it, dyslexia can be isolating, yes. Um, peers around you knowing that you are dyslexic is immediately halving that problem. Uh, effective negative interactions or a sort of dyslexia can actually lead to you being the topic or the subject of, of teasing or bullying or ridicule um, or being picked on. Uh, affect negative social and emotional development, so relationships that you form with, with peers who are friends and, and emotional development around friendships is a different expectation to what perhaps the other person might have. Um, be embarrassing and even humiliating. It can be, I'm sure, embarrassing and humiliating. Um, and those also go with, with the teasing and the, the ridicule um, where far too many dyslexics have, have reported being embarrassed and humiliated by peers and certainly as younger young adults uh, be hard work every single day i cannot stress enough how hard that must be every day as well that not knowing in a morning when you get up whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day when it can start out a good day very good with things going right and then things go wrong very quickly uh, so you have to keep at it every single day to keep on a level plane. Um, making you feel daft or stupid. Adults have, and children are very good at that, but in the workplace that can be very, very damaging if you are actually doing your very best, um, but colleagues keep ridiculing your work or, or drawing attention to things that you do wrong. Um, and that can happen whether you've disclosed yourself as dyslexic or otherwise. Sometimes it's worse when you disclose. We, we've heard on helplines how um, people have gone to a great deal of, of trouble to say they understand and uh, yes, we'll make allowances. And within a very short time, they're making jokes that, that are inappropriate. Um, and be very, very confusing in a non-dyslexic world. Uh, it certainly can. Um, and it's going back to 
this hard work every single day. Okay, in the workplace then, some of the uh, tasks, specific difficulties and what you can do about them are okay. Taking notes, um, succinct notes and, and in lectures. Now, if you have engaged in a, a relationship with your peers where they know that you are dyslexic uh, and they know and understand your difficulties, um, then half the battle is won. Uh, many of the difficulties that are talked about can actually be circumvented. And since this pandemic, um, students are doing so much work on more work online, not in lecture halls or in classrooms. Uh, for many dyslexics, the change of this modus operandi, if you like, has been to their advantage. But looking at each of these difficulties presented here, um, with peer support, they could be less of a problem and give you some ideas. If you're taking notes or you need to take notes, why not ask a friend if you can copy or scan their notes into your computer? Um, you'd be amazed at how many people would say, yes, of course, try it and see. Um, following discussions. With a pre-arrangement, a strategy could be to arrange for you to make key notes uh, one word that describes the focus of that meeting or discussion. Ask a peer then if they can fill you in on uh, the the main points of the of the meeting, um, so that you have got something yourself that you've put down the key points, and they can be, you can make sense of those if one of your peers would give you the information that goes with those key points that you've raised. And listening to a recording, asking if you can record, listen to recordings and elaborate on the discussion with your friends so that you can make sense of and, and remember the key points of the discussion. Presenting an argument then, uh, again, using a friend or a colleague, ask them to listen to your ideas about the topic. What is for the argument and what is against it? Then ask them to hear you run through your presentation as a critical friend. And by that, I mean, sort of, have they got a different viewpoint of the argument? Have you missed the point completely? Um, or have they missed the point completely? So it works two ways, but certainly it's, it's a good idea to actually share what you've done and discuss what you've done by getting somebody else to see what you've done before you actually hand that piece of work or hand that report to somebody, um, making sure that it's had the benefit of more than one pair of eyes or ears. So developing listening skills then, um, working again with a friend, telling the tutor what you're going to be doing, why, and pick on one or two questions, ask for time in the seminar to briefly work on one or two responses only, then ask if you can deliver one response to a seminar question. It's all about negotiation, it's all about making reasonable adjustments, and at work, college or in the workplace you are entitled to reasonable adjustments. Uh, it's demonstrating also how you can work differently, how you can use peer support, um, it can lead to greater understanding about the topic that you're involved in and demonstrate to the group your valuable contributions. So it works both ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. Using a friend to work as a critical pair of ears. In speaking and listening activities, write your ideas down in large print and use those as your cue sheet. Ask a, a friend to also have a copy. Um, of those cues and to actually use eye contact to show you whether you've got them on the right track or not. Okay, have you missed something? Getting them to be a, a critical pair of ears uh, and a pair of eyes, but also as a, a sort of a, a non-verbal signifier, if you like, of something that you may have missed. Uh, set this up before the session and when you're planning your speech or, or writing, build that in. In written work, uh, can they perhaps proofread your ideas and check them against your cue sheet? So, okay, so it's, it's structured cues, really, if you like, to actually get share those with somebody else and get their feedback and to get their support in delivering what it is that you've got to deliver. Um, 
number six organizing your information this takes practice and again uh, can be really good to use another person ask a friend to be your proofreader first at your planning stage to make sure that your planning structure is in the right sequence if you like uh, then as your written work proofreader and if you like finally as, you, as your editor you don't have to use one peer you could use one peer for each particular part of that activity and that way you're extending your relationship within your group who then gets a greater understanding of what difficulties are part of your dyslexia um, and deadlines now, peer support can help you there. Everybody worries about deadlines, some people more than others. Um, but constantly being reminded by a tutor or a peer or a line manager, uh, if you're at work, um, can help. Um, it's not least as it's getting nearer and nearer to the, the deadline date that you're supposed to hand the work to people. Um, and by the time you've, you've finished and got it ready to be handed in, um, working on your, have I got the time right? Have you negotiated for an extension or whatever? Don't just sit back and assume that people won't mind things being late. People do mind things very much, especially if you're in college or university and you've been given a date uh, and you're given plenty of warning of that date uh, and then and you have to ask for an extension at the last minute. If you think you're going to have a difficulty or even if you think you could possibly have a difficulty, try negotiating right before the, way before the hand date, when the hand date date is first mentioned, negotiate then, explain the difficulties that you have and see if you can get them to actually meet you, if you like, on negotiating an extension. So actually asking, not for the extension at that time, but ask, giving a warning, if you like, um, that I might need an extension. And then as you're getting nearer to the date, it's looking extremely likely that you will, negotiating a, another timeline and a, an extension to that. Uh, you'll find more often than not, somebody will come forward and say, well, is there anything we can help with? Um, but it's taking that risk. And finally, time. Time management, uh, <clears throat> time is your enemy. Time management for many dyslexics is not a problem, but it is a problem for those around them. It is a problem for those who live with them. Uh, and the, the consequences of um, a day of 24 hours, understanding the concept of a morning and afternoon and a lunch break. If it's interspersed with meals, that's fine. You've got the structure of breakfast, lunch, morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea. and But, but that... Is, that is giving you a, a structure for the day, yes, but not for the hours within that day. Uh, and it's there, the, the finer points of time management that a lot of dyslexics have the problem with. So it's just sort of highlighting some of the specific difficulties and hopefully some of the suggestions I'm making might help as well. Oh, workplace difficulties then, organisation difficulties, um, both in personal and in um, uh, planning for whatever it is you're doing at work or study. Uh, poor planning and poor timekeeping. Time to read and taken to read and reread written material constantly before comprehending the text. So you've got something to read that's specific to what it is you've got to do afterwards, <clears throat> be it a review or whatever. And you actually need the time to constantly reread. So first time is reading you're decoding the, the text the second time of reading you're decoding the words and putting them together to make understand the, of the sentences and the third time you're reading it you're getting a fluency that will lead you to a greater sort of understanding of what the text is all about and it can go on you can probably read things several times um, highlight things that you think are important work out uh, results uh, work re output results, so they, they don't match the effort that you put into the job. Um, so for those of you who employ people with dyslexia, actually look beyond what you actually see because it's, it's ducks on the water, their feet are going like mad underneath that water, but they look calm on the exterior. 
just sitting there, but there's a lot of effort going into doing what you've been asked, you have asked them to do. Fatigue and tiredness can be misinterpreted as boredom, um, lack of attachment to a task that's being performed. Even their reaction to you as a person it can be misconstrued. Looking at them as an audience member, you could think they're extremely bored with what you're saying, but that is hiding all sorts of things that are actually going on behind the eyes. Uh, forgetfulness, that is a, a big problem for many dyslexics. Um, and it gets worse the older you get, I can assure you. <clears throat> but it, it's something that a lot of dyslexics actually work very hard at from a very young age. Not being forgetful, remembering not to forget things. Um, so, you know, it's, it really is a personal thing that you uh, devise your own strategies for remembering something that's important. Um, and remembering something can, and attaching a, another cue to it if you like um, you've got to remember what the cue's for uh, I did know a gentleman who tied a piece of string around his um, index finger uh, and he said I walked around with it all day thinking I shan't forget that I shan't forget that and he came to the end of the day and he had no idea what it is he got to remember but he remembered that the string reminded him so find, find a, a strategy that's successful for you um, taking longer to do things and compared to workplaces, that, you know, to colleagues in the workplace, it can be very irritating to your um, colleagues that they're doing their best to hand things in on time or to finish things or complete things and you're holding up the works and, and if it happens again and again, um, the tolerance levels disappear. Um, forgetfulness, yes. Um, good ideas, yeah, wonderful ideas. Um, but often difficulty in implementing them. Um, a lot of people with dyslexia that I've met have been the most creative and their ideas are ten a penny, chum, 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 the ideas. You know. But it's actually catching that idea and, and holding it still long enough to actually do something with it. So peer support in adults then requires a relationship based on trust. Uh, requires an explanation to the peers about the exceptionalities of dyslexia. Um, explain to your peers what the difficulties are, what the strengths are, what does, what does it affect, what does it mean to, to you as a person with dyslexia, what does it mean, and start answering their questions, yes, but filling in the blanks as well, so that you get a very personal view of, of what dyslexia is for you and what are the exceptionalities and what things are you good at, what are your strengths and what are the weaknesses beyond reading and writing. Um, it can help to develop strategies to provide a, a strength-based peer support system, which is uh, an extremely useful thing to do. Um, it can help students learn how to access resources and learn study methods or at work, in the workplace, learning from your colleagues. Uh, can increase opportunities for learning, uh, increase a sense of belonging and help build the, uh, the self-esteem of the person. And peer support can be used in a strength-based approach um, to actually develop positive ways of coping um, by showing what you're good at first and then what, you diff what difficulties you find and try to get their understanding that this is something that is every single day, not just this is as long as I've got the flu or as long as I've got bronchitis or whatever. It, it is, I, I'm a dyslexic person every single day. So all of these difficulties on any given day can raise their head and actually getting them to understand that and remove the mystery if you like and dispel some of the myths because some people have some very strange ideas of what dyslexia is but actually educating your colleagues in the workplace of what dyslexia actually is. Okay so moving on then to disclosure, deciding whether or not to disclose. Many factors have to be considered and it has to be a very personal choice as well. 
Um, so self-disclosure it should be driven by context and situation. There might be places where it's essential, there might be places where it's not as important as other times. Uh, it's the management of personal information, so you are divulging personal information about your um, strengths, your weaknesses, uh, that you have a condition, a disorder, a disability, whatever you, way you look at it, you have something that is permanent and part of you. So it's personal information that you are disclosing to whoever um, and you would expect the same sort of respect for that as if you were disclosing um, a health issue or a, a medical problem or whatever. Uh, it's nestled in the larger concept of self-determination. So a strong self-determination would be somebody who was confident enough and informed enough to disclose publicly um, to more than one audience um, because they have under a greater understanding of their person as a whole, um, their self, and that the dyslexia is part of them um, and this is what I do and this is how I do it. And if there is a risk behind doing it uh, that people will treat you differently, negatively or whatever, then I would think it would be probably not in anybody's interest for you to actually disclose, but it is a very personal um, situation and something that I would never advise on. It protects in some contexts, so if you actually do disclose um, that you actually have got uh, the other person who you've, you've disclosed to understand that part of you that is dyslexic. Uh, so by actually disclosing some, in some situations in the workplace where it could be actually dangerous, some of the um, difficulties that dyslexia can cause. So it, it would protect... I'll give an example. Um, if you are, for example, a, a lab technician working in sciences, but uh, in a a technical job as opposed to being a scientist practicing. Um, making mistakes with chemicals, that would be dangerous. Uh, if you were a chef or training to be a chef um, and misreading things like cayenne and cinnamon, uh, the effect would be quite catastrophic. So to actually self-disclose before um, you, you see these situations arising or know that they're likely to be can actually protect you because they are whoever it is, the employer or the educator or whatever um, is aware of the fact that you could possibly um, that could be one of your weaknesses or strengths even um, that was responsible for the outcome there uh, and it must, if you are going to disclose, it must include information and, and not just the label of dyslexia. So self-disclosure, as Price and Gerber said, is, is literally, it's just the beginning. So negative factors first in the workplace. Um, again, research has shown 41% chose not to disclose it in their job. If they did disclose it, uh, it was to obtain job accommodations. Uh, fear of ridicule and stereotyping. Uh, fear of reprisal, um, demotion, losing a position at work or taking off a college or university course. Um, it will change the way people treat or think about me. And yes, that, that is a, that can be one very real outcome. Um, not lesser or more, um, but it will change the way people treat you or think you, uh, about you. Um, it would depend very much on the situation and upon the individual who you've disclosed to. Um, my employer won't understand why I do things a different way. That's a very real concern and one that can affect the mental health and well-being of many adult dyslexics. Um, not only doing a job that they're finding difficulty and, and managing to hold down 
with through sheer hard work every day um, but t by f thinking that if they find out that I'm dyslexic that they will see me as not being up to the job or not being up to par and feelings of embarrassment or, or shame and, and sort of and even guilt those were some of the things that would stop people disclosing um, so positive ones counteract some of the negative it's the first step towards being a strong self-advocate uh, reduces feelings of being trapped or imprisoned or even found out i cannot imagine what it's like going to work or going to study or university or college or whatever uh, and concealing something on a daily basis like being dyslexic and to worry about being found out it's, it, it's an appalling situation and one that should uh, it should change it must change um, huge feelings of relief and determination and hope when you've disclosed uh, I should imagine it's like having the lid taken off a boiling pot it's uh, the relief and the uh, I don't know, I met a young lady four years ago who um, was diagnosed at the age of 18. She'd gone all through school struggling and at the age of 18 she had been diagnosed and she got a diagnosis and she was working with her mum down um, a shopping mile in Hobart and she kept going up to total strangers and saying, excuse me, do you know I'm dyslexic? total strangers and the mother said I was cringing with embarrassment but she said not one person said so they all said oh and all asked questions but she's total strangers and this kid she said would, was just so relieved that after all these years of, of, of being a misfit and a, a worry because she was different you know, all of a sudden she had got the power and the, the, the strength of mind to actually share this with total strangers um, so releasing that energy, the energy that went into worrying with about dyslexia, then it can be channeled into developing practical and emotional supporting skills. And employer can develop reasonable adjustments too that you can negotiate with. And these can be incorporated in the job description of what you're doing. And most important, it makes it easier for the next employee with dyslexia. If you're changing things in your workplace, for dyslexia not just for you you're changing it for dyslexia so it will make it easier for the company to understand for the next uh, employee that they have with dyslexia so the emotional consequences then and this was a lovely one this was sylvia moody has done quite a lot of work on uh, adult dyslexics and dyslexics at college as well and this was a, one that was cited it's an old quote because it's 16 17 years old um, but it's one that i thought was really positive to have here the emotional consequences of disclosure then i felt as if the prison doors had been opened i looked out and saw the paths leading in all directions i didn't know which path was mine all i know was that i would have a path in the future and that the years of confinement were finally over i think that sort of says quite a lot about the the relief and the uh, the positive aspect of coming out <laughs> and that you're dyslexic so developing self-advocacy we move on then into looking at positive dyslexia being educated or begin educating others uh, challenges of dyslexia may may be disabling but also make the individuals more determined to succeed um, a lot of dys dyslexics are very resilient people and when you're resilient you can rise above certain things and we've seen today in our present presenters uh, you can rise above an awful lot of things with dyslexia and uh, depending very much on you as an individual and the qualities that they have described um, are the ones that the positive dyslexics have got and uh, develop and memorize coping strategies so work at things that support you um, developing a dyslexia or other takes a, a very emotional toll and protects the protect against this by uh, using strengths to compensate um, and cope with the uh, the negatives 
five factors for positive dyslexia then for developing positive dyslexia boost your self-esteem praise yourself a lot for what you do make a positive assessment of your needs promote your positive attitudes or attributes ensure appropriate motivating and consistent learning preferences are employed and recognize and enhance creative skills so this is the new you the positive you um, you're going to praise yourself and build up your your self-esteem with congratulating yourself on the things that work um, make a positive assessment of your needs what do i need to do what do i need to say where do i need to go um, and to get your reasonable adjustments understand what your needs and your entitlements are promote your positive attitudes so when you're talking about your dyslexia tell them first the positive sides uh, and what you can do that a non-dyslexic perhaps could not ensuring appropriate motivation consistent learning preferences are employed so only using the things that you know work and recognizing the skills that you've got and getting better at them so boost your self-esteem uh, you need to be successful at something anything but something pick on something that you've succeeded at and build that into something that you can really say well yes i've achieved on that despite thinking i wouldn't um developing positive feedback from others so asking other people how they think that you've you've got on um what did they think of your performance getting, getting a sort of their not approval but their um perception of what it is that you have just delivered or whatever uh just getting them to say you know can you tell me a few words about what you thought about what i've just done um do you think that piece of work is up to or whatever um it's stressing that dyslexia is a difference it's not a deficit and learn that as a mantra so if anybody talks about dyslexia you say oh yes dyslexia is a learning difference it's not a deficit it's a difference okay uh, find your strengths and develop those recognize your own successes rather than your feelings avoid learned helplessness um, learn to be successful within the tasks that you are setting and the parameters that you're setting yourself and allow yourself to be proud of yourself you know if you succeed at something share it you know? um, and the best way uh, uh, self-advocacy this is a lovely quote from Kelly Sunderman um, the best way to advocate uh, with dyslexia is to be so well informed that no one can or wants to argue with you so herein lies the secret uh, get skilled up okay the more you know about dyslexia the better um key skills then for advocacy self-advocacy ability to speak up and ask for yourself on your own behalf um, find out as much as you can about dyslexia uh, use that knowledge to tell others about it skills to work on can be communication collaboration presentation and maintaining professional standards or relationships um, so these are the areas that you're going to work on um, telling yourself how good you are at this building up your self-esteem and building up the strength to advocate for yourself so learn how to develop respectfully assertiveness okay assertiveness is not being bossy it's not what it's about at all it's asserting your rights and asserting your position without being offensive uh, so confidence to speak up for what you want um, so you have to develop the power of assertiveness actually rising up and having yes i can ask for it they might say no they might say yes to something else uh, but speak up for what you want knowing your rights skill up on your knowledge uh, about dyslexia um, and particularly dyslexia and the law uh, negotiate skills and develop how to negotiate with others to achieve the ends that you want rather than the ends that they want okay and speaking up for yourself is very important um, and that is something that you'll have to work upon and get right uh, five tips then for self-advocacy know 
how you think. Metacognition, a very posh, posh word for something that just means understanding how you think, okay? Uh, how you are planning, how you're working out what it is that you're going to do next, knowing how you think. L learn the law and know your rights, okay? So it's important that you know the legal position. If you're asking for something because you assume it's going to be legally um, possible for that request to be uh, granted, um, fine, yes, but know your rights and know the law before you actually quote your your law, your rights at people. Um, it's okay to care, so don't be afraid of showing emotions concerning your difficulties. There's nothing wrong with crying. Uh, if somebody is asking you about your dyslexia and you're having a bad day, then it's quite all right to have a good cry at the same time uh, it, it probably scares other people more than it scares you but it, it's okay to show those feelings and those emotions uh, and don't you worry about it find your tribe can't advocate strongly enough a support group okay if you've got a, a support group behind you you will learn more about dyslexia, you will get that knowledge and you will learn more about how to advocate for yourself. Um, there's strength in numbers, as they say, so find your tribe, find a support group, um, be it a student group, be it a, um, a group of like-minded professionals, um, be it a, any sort of group that if you can find a dyslexia support group, even online, you don't necessarily have to attend meetings on a Monday night or whatever, but certainly online support, there are millions of sites out there, um, you just find the right one, start start with the recognised advocacy groups like the Australian Dyslexia Association or the Dyslexic Foundation, go, go to somewhere where you know you're going to have good information and good feedback. Be confident even if you don't feel it. So showing that you are in command, you are confident, um, regardless of whether you feel it or not. So self-advocacy then is a skill that you could have a direct and transformative impact on a student's success. Okay, so interesting factoids. Many creative people with dyslexia only take control of their learning after they leave school. So all these successful dyslexics you see in adulthood probably had a really, really negative experience throughout their education, um, but once they left school, they flew. Many successful dyslexics were considered school failures. Yes, definitely. Research shows that people with dyslexia exhibit strengths that see in the big picture that non-dyslexics tend to miss. And people with dyslexia see the unseen. Look up Tom West's work, uh, a visualizer, a dyslexic with visual strengths. Uh, in summary then, we've looked at the general profile of dyslexia and reported strengths and weaknesses. We've looked at comorbidity. Um, and coexisting conditions. We've highlighted aspects of dyslexia in adults, uh, examined peer support, uh, what it is and what you, you can actually achieve with peer, peer support. We've looked at dealing with disclosure, uh, emotional consequences, and we've looked at self-advocacy um, and the advantages and disadvantages of dyslexia. What are the skills that you need? What do you need to do? So, your take-home message, the positive dyslexia movement turns dyslexia as a disability stereotype on its head. Positive dyslexia starts with strengths and guides dyslexic people to discover, develop and live their strengths. And that should be the message that you take home from this. So, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the rest of our conference. Thank you.